Um, okay, um, a bit about me. Uh, my name is Christian Merkert. Um, I'm based in Poland, uh, though I'm not from Poland originally. Um, I'm a, a Google developer expert for machine learning. Google developer experts, these are kind of, there's a small number of people that uh, have, let's say, they have special experience with certain Google products. It can be Firebase, it can be cloud in general, it can be Android, uh, it can be machine learning, and usually we go to different conferences and speak about it, but that doesn't mean we work for Google, and it doesn't mean that we speak for Google, right? Like, I mean, I get information from Google, but uh, 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 I'm, not, uh, I'm not employed by Google. I'm not on the payroll. Uh, I, I was working for Google for several years, uh, but, but I'm now, I'm, now I'm working in a small um, startup. It's called Flyer. Uh, it's based in San Francisco and in Krakow. Um, we are hiring. Um, so I had to say that, right? Um, and what we do is we, we use deep reinforcement learning for airline revenue management. And airline revenue management, that basically means we try to determine what should be the price of a flight ticket. Um, you you <clears throat> for sure realize that flight tickets have different prices at different, let's say, time before, before the flight is leaving, before departure. And that's of course because, you know, there's a, let's say, there's a different demand situation. So we try to capture this with machine learning and actually that, that, that seems to work. So uh, it's actually quite, it, for me it's a super interesting area. Uh, deep reinforcement learning is something that, of course, open uh, AI, deep mind are doing, uh, but we try to really use it in a business setting, so uh, uh, we are quite proud on that, actually. Um, okay, I will try to talk a bit about TensorFlow. What is TensorFlow? TensorFlow 1, that was the TensorFlow up to now. The version, it, it was a series of versions up to now, versus uh, t TensorFlow 2, that's a new series of versions, it's just started with 2.0, 2.1 is already, it's, it's almost, it's, it's already out, you can get a nightly for that, uh, and it's quite a, a drastic change, um, and hopefully a change for the better, you might have a different opinion on that when you use it, um, I, I, I like it, so that's something. Um, I will try to show you Colab notebooks, who, who heard about a Colab notebook? Who used a Colab notebook? Why? Why so little? That's okay. Uh, possible applications, the way, to, if we get there, uh, then I will talk about upgrading uh, TensorFlow 1 code to, to, to TensorFlow 2, and definitely I would show you some links where we can get more. I prepared some exercises for you. You need a laptop for the exercise. You need a Gmail account. I guess everyone has a Gmail account. Who oh, no. Okay. <laughs> You can make it, so please make one. Okay, it's for free, still. Um, I don't get money from Google, once again. Um, uh, for the exercises, we need a laptop, we need internet, and we, we need a Gmail account. And you need to be signed into a Gmail account. Uh, it works best if you have, if you are Chrome, but it should work with Firefox and, and stuff as well. Um, I prepared a lot of slides. Let's see how far we can get. You can at any point ask me something, Shout, slower, faster, whatever, whatever it is, right? Okay, I will try to more or less go into it. Uh, I don't know everything about 2.0. I didn't, I, I'm not in the development team. I don't, you know, I, 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 I know certain parts of it. For other parts, I would need to, 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 to um, direct you to, to some groups that, that can maybe answer some questions. Um, okay. TensorFlow, what's TensorFlow? Okay. Um, it's a pi package for Python. Not only for Python, but let's, let's assume for the moment it's a package for Python, okay? And it's, well, Python is a slow thingy, right? Like, you multiply two matrices, and it is super slow, right? It takes like, like minutes and not seconds, okay? But because Python is an interpreted language, it's, you know, it's kind of very high level. It's not C++, it's not Java, it's not, you know, not Go or whatever it is, right? But still, if you want to do numeric math, you can do it with NumPy. And NumPy is super fast, and it's basically like a package for Python, works really good. Okay, why? Because it, it, it has C code or C++ code that is, that's just compiled, and, and it's just called from, from, from Python as kind of an API. 
And TensorFlow is basically a similar idea. It's a C++ backend that is like available from Python. It's also available, uh, available from other languages. But actually, it's m still m best integrated with Python, I would say. There are some ideas to go to Swift or, or something like that. I'm not really into that. Um, that might be something for the future. Um, it's a package that's designated or designed for deep learning. And you know what's a tensor? It's a matrix. And what's a matrix? A matrix is a rectangle of numbers, right? Like a rectangle with whatever, 10, 10, 10 columns and 20 rows. That's a tensor. Actually, a tensor doesn't need to always be a rectangle. It can be just a, a, a list of numbers. Then it would be a vector. That would be a one-dimensional tensor. It can be a sim simple number, a single number, 2.7, right? Which would be a zero-dimensional tensor. It can be not a matrix. It can be a cube of numbers, right? Like a, a lot of matri matrices stacked on top of each other. That would be a three-dimensional tensor, and so on. You can have five, six, seven-dimensional tensors. Of course, a six-dimensional tensor, if you have 10 by 10 by 10 by 10 dimensions, you get already like a million of numbers, right? Which is a lot. OK, and TensorFlow is quite popular. It's quite uh, used. Uh, it has lots of contributors. It's on GitHub. It's free. It's open source. Uh, Apache 2 license was released in Google by in 2015. And it's still in, in heavy development. OK. and. It kind of has been a success. Let's say it like this, OK? Um, there's a lot of stuff around. It's not only TensorFlow. There's TensorFlow Lite. You know what is that used for? That is when you develop a, a deep learning model or a machine learning model and you want to deploy it to some, some, you know, some small device, I mean, some device on the edge, a phone, uh, whatever, some dash cam in the car, uh, and, you know, there, there, there's actually tons of applications. Raspberry Pi, whatever. Um, th th that's, that's kind of a framework to create very small models that are very efficient, very lightweight, uh, and can be used. Um, there's TensorFlow Hub where you can see, where you can get uh, large models. What is a, do, you have a, do you know, for example, what's a large TensorFlow? What, what can a large TensorFlow model do? Do you know applications? Well, you can use it for fine tuning. Yeah, so this is what, what TensorFlow Hub is doing. For example, there are TensorFlow models that translate from one language into another language, right? I mean, deep learning is quite cool. Like, you can do amazing stuff. I mean, stuff that 10 years ago people didn't think that would be possible. Now you have, like, BERT, or uh, it, it's, a large, it's a very large model that allows you to, to translate from one language to another language. You can work on text. You can automatically try to get semantics from text. Of course, you can detect objects and images, or you can create a self-driving car. So you segment a scene, you know that's a car, there's a pedestrian, there are trees, the street is going here. Um, actually, Andre Caparte did a very nice uh, talk, and you can find it on YouTube. That's just like, a, I don't know, 10 days ago. He tells how they use the, the, the camera images in Tesla, in, in the Tesla car. I think these are several cameras, and they create from this one bird's eye view of the, of the surrounding of the car, where they try to map everything what is there, right? This is street, this is drivable area, this is, these are other cars, so um, it's kind of, kind of amazing. All that stuff works basically, you, 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 you shuffle large tensors, like, you know, numbers or sets of numbers, you shuffle them around, you process them. That's all done like that, right? It's quite quite amazing that this works, right? Uh, people didn't think about that uh, 10 years ago. There was the so-called AI winter, and it turned out into a kind of AI summer. Uh, let's see how long that summer keeps. OK. There's a large ecosystem around. Let me skip that. that that's actually not super well done. OK. If you dealt with TensorFlow 1.0, um, it, it had a really, it, it was complicated. It was complicated to use. Uh, the biggest thing, the biggest kind of problem is you, whatever you did, you, you, you didn't specify the computation, you specified a graph that tells you how the computation would, what, uh, should, should go. So you wrote a program that wrote a program. So like inception, right? Like, like one, let's go deeper one level. 
Um, that made it super awkward to, to, to really understand what's going on and whenever you did something you couldn't see results immediately and it, whenever you wanted to, to get a result you, you had to define a session. You see that here, can you see the mouse? Yeah. Okay. Um, and you had to define a session and run a graph and you know, while this might be beautiful for some people, for most people it isn't, right? Okay, so TensorFlow to zero is a kind of a fresh approach after many lessons learned, after many criticism and, and you know, like shouts for improvement. Okay, and unfortunately TensorFlow to zero introduces breaking changes, many of them, um, but it's for the good. Uh, enable a better user experience, fi fix buggy or inconsistent behavior, uh, remove duplicated code passes, I mean duplicated like, like API uh, passes, and it, it should definitely allow for future optimization. Okay, so if you didn't work with TensorFlow before, it's now a good time to start, because 2.0 seems for me to be one of the major changes, so now you could have a fresh start and it should be somehow easier. Okay, okay, let's let's start with something. Let's start with something. Oh okay now you guys you have to um, you have to download a gigabyte of Anaconda to to uh, start working. Okay, now you got it. Okay, what's a joke. Um, there's Google Cola. You didn't hear about it, now you hear about it. Okay. It's a free hosted Python Jupyter notebook. Anyone use Jupyter? Okay. Okay, so we, I, we will get to this. Okay, batteries included. A lot of stuff is installed, like TensorFlow, NumPy, Pandas, actually tons of stuff. And the best thing is um, all the CUDA and, and, and all the, the, the nitty gritty uh, uh, underlying, like, you know, dependencies are kind of uh, cared for. Um, and your notebook, your notebook is basically, I, I will show you in a second, it will be more clear. It lives on G Drive. So it's always there. It's always stored. It's stored in the cloud. You cannot use. You cannot lose it. You can share it with someone else. You can even work with several people on it. Despite I do not really recommend to do that because it's super confusing. Um, of course, you need to be online to work with it. That's. I mean, that's. When this is huge, right? You, you guys are online here, right? <laughs> you have internet. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is the the uh, 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 this is kind of the the um, let's say the entry point to cola. I will leave this for a second. You just can also type cola like collaboratory, like like working together, but also like laboratory, like like something to experiment. Okay, it's Python, right? It's not Java, it's not Scala, it's Python. Um, so of course I I. I uh, uh, we will from now, from, 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 for this session, definitely we will work with Python. Uh, you can start it here, but actually I, I prepared for you a small cola. And here's the address, it's a short link. It's 2CX2JE9. Please open that. And show me, that, uh, t t tell me, if it doesn't work, tell me. Because, uh, Works? Okay, because I need to um, share the you know the thing properly. Okay, let's maybe I will also try to go into it. Okay, so I will try to go into it. So whoever has a laptop, please try to you know try to try yourself. Or you cannot break anything. I mean, you could, but you would need to try very hard to break some break some stuff. Okay, so this is a this is a this is a Jupyter notebook. A Jupyter notebook is a mix of text and code cells. This is a code cell. This is a text cell. This is again a code cell, right? And this is how I execute this this cell. Uh, this cell. If I press on the play button, okay, uh, I need to open it in. Ah, sorry, I need to open it in playground. So now I'm in playground mode again. That means we can really do very little harm. And then we say this notebook was not authored by Google. It's okay. Okay, this is how you can execute the cell. So you have a Python kernel. You have a Python interpreter that is running behind. 
and you basically execute a cell and all the outputs of the cell, all the variables, all the state of the cell is still, uh, is still like kept in the kernel, right? So for example, here we can execute something. Okay, now what, is ex what I think is extremely cool about Colab is that you can share that, right? You can, you can share it with, with either specific people or you can create the link. You can create a link and copy a link and you can even decide that people want, uh, can view it or can, can comment or can edit it, okay? But there's something even much more cooler. Now you ask, where's my node, where's the code executed? Do, do, you, do you know where this code is executed? <coughs> Which computer? On my laptop? No, in the cloud. This is on some virtual machine, somewhere in, in a Google data center. It's executed for free, okay? For free is nice, right? Um, there's even something much, much cooler. Like for me, I mean, I, at least I think it's amazingly cool. It's not only that you can get this virtual machine that is, of course, in, in, in some sense, it would cost only a few cents per hour. You can get a GPU. What's a GPU? Yes. What for do we need a GPU? For playing games? Sure. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I get it. Okay. Um, definitely you can use GPUs for playing games. It, that, that's how it started. Uh, GPUs allow you to do super fast computations because actually they are very, they are like a coprocessor, right? They can crunch a lot of numbers. They are 10 times faster than even a fast Intel or AMD CPU. Okay, there's something, but you saw something more here, right? You saw that, a TPU. It's a tensor processing unit. It's a dedicated chip made by Google. Let's, let's, let me see if I can, if I can, if I can get something. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I don't even know what this means. <laughs> um, location, location based uh, results, right? Um, a TPU is such kind of a, it's actually a chip. It's actually a chip that is have a look. This is how it looks like. Um, you don't see a lot. You see the cooling, the cooling elements here. And basically, it gives you 180 teraflops uh, of compute power, which is kind of a lot. So 10 years ago, it would bring you into the top 500 supercomputer list. One, right? You can get them. Actually, you can get. This is the version two. There's version three. With the call up, you get version two, not version three. Uh, so you get 180 teraflops, not 420. I measured it, I can get reliably 170 plus, 170 plus teraflops of, of, uh, uh, of performance. That's incredibly much. I mean, at least compared to whatever what you could do some years ago, it's super, super much. And you get this here for free. I mean, uh, let's see how long Google is doing, giving that for free, but um, um, I didn't prepare for you now anything specially for, for, for TPU, um, but for example at work I use it to, to crunch the, the airline data and I can crunch years of data in minutes, which is, yeah, I, I like it very much. I'm, I'm just afraid Google will turn off uh, our free TPU access at some point because we are using it super much. You can of course get a TPU in, in, in Google Cloud for it's about four or five dollars an hour, so not extremely expensive. Okay, so um, let's go back to this here. We don't need a TPU, we can use a CPU or a GPU. Uh, let's try to execute this cell here. Okay, it takes some time, it should be actually super fast. Um, but yeah, it's not that easy. You have a saying in Poland like, like life is always against the wind. Like, right? It's, it's always, you know, like, your life is always up here. Okay, so basically what did this do? First of all, it selected uh, TensorFlow to zero. Well, it is selected a two-something version of TensorFlow. That's currently to zero. I think before the end of the year, we will have to one. Um, and then we imported it, and we just printed the version. Okay, yeah, let's get started with, with uh, uh, let's get started, okay, let me do the following. What, what do you think is the output of this cell, this cell here? 
15, yes, come on, that is easy. What did I multi I multiplied two tensors here. Okay, this is stupid, right? I mean, you could do this in Python 20 years ago, okay? Um, so it's just to, to show it. The thing is what you see, you don't have to run a session. You don't have to define a graph. You simply type the stuff like in NumPy. Okay, uh, what was that, what A was, was a tensor with which shape, with which dimension? Zero dimensional tensor, just a scalar. Okay, and now we define a new tensor A. What is the shape? <coughs> two by two, right. Okay, and we can always go back from a tensor flock uh, tensor to a NumPy array. Basically, NumPy is also like working on arrays, so you could call it array, you can call it tensor, whatever you think is more fancy. Okay. Yeah, we go back. This is this is this is not super typical. What do you think is this thing doing? What? No, we are no place. In a moment, no place. So there's no. Yeah, yeah. Place two tensors, two by four, and then just add them together. It adds them and then it computes the, the square of them. It creates here two tensors, and they they are filled with with random yeah. numbers. And they are filled with with normal with a normal distribution, this is a Gaussian distribution. Um, the with center center is zero and standard deviation is one. Okay. And what is this cell doing? That's a bit more. That's a bit more challenging, I guess. It computes the gradient of uh, y to x. Yeah. Exactly. So you, you know in deep learning how deep learning it's um, it's a super high uh, <coughs> term. What happens in deep learning? Basically, you create a long chain of let's say you create a neural networks with lots of layers, and in the end you have a loss, and you compute the gradient of the loss with respect to your weights. Weights are basically the the tensors, matrices that you that you multiply with your inputs, okay? And then when you do this, you do a gradient step and you go slowly down, you know, you're trying to, to minimize the loss by very many small steps down the gradient, okay? So what NumPy doesn't have and what TensorFlow has, not only TensorFlow, there are other packages, Theano, PyTorch, whatever, they have an automatic differentiation. So you can automatically compute the, the, the num numeric gradient. Okay, and here the function that we computed here that was the square. What is the so so x squared? Okay, if you if you compute the derivative of x squared, this is what two x right? And x was set here to three, so the result should be six. Well, this is a trivial this is a trivial thingy, but in principle, you know, we see that this works. Um, now, if you ask me, I mean, this is a numeric differentiation. It's not precise. The funny thing is, it works, right? It works even, deep learning works even over small discontinuities and then stuff like that. That's actually extremely interesting. Okay, cool. Um, we did this already. So I'm trying to, to, to skip through this. Okay, that was kind of simplistic, okay? Um, let's try a deep learning model. And for deep learning, you know, like I said, you have to define a lot of neural network you need to define a lot of layers um, because deep actually me meant just that you don't have one hidden layer in a neural network. You have four, five, six, whatever, okay, or ten, or twenty, or a hundred. Um, so writing this, everything like defining every every weight matrix, it's a lot of work. So there there are high level packages for defining a deep learning model, and one is called. You see here, you see that K. You know what is this K? Keras. Keras, wow. Who worked with Keras? Yes, okay. So TensorFlow loves Keras. Keras actually is kind of a part of TensorFlow. So um, you know TensorFlow was developed by um, a French guy, Francois Cholet. Um, so he, he, it existed before TensorFlow. It was initially used Teano as a backend, and then it, it, it also integrated TensorFlow, and now it kind of became a part of TensorFlow. So there's two, two types of care, two flavors of Keras. 
There's the standard Keras, the reference implementation, and you would get it when you say import Keras, right? If you want to get the, the more deeper integrated version, then please use the following line, from TensorFlow, import Keras. Uh, th th that definitely gives you lots of advantages, especially when you work with Cola. Okay? Okay. In Keras, you can specify a model and you have several ways to do it. Um, there are three or four ways to do it. I won't show you all of them. Um, I will show you the kind of the easy way. Um, the easiest way is to define a sequential model. And sequential model doesn't mean we work on sequences of text or something like that. It means we, we have a sequence of layers, okay? And usually we start, uh, so, so we, 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 we open here the sequential and we give a list of the layers. We start here out with a flattening because our data is maybe a matrix, uh, like each input sample is a matrix and we want to make it a vector. And then we have a dense layer, a dense neural network layer. That means actually every neuron in this layer is connected to every piece of the input. Uh, not, not, not to the output, but to the input. Then we have a dropout layer, and then we have another dense layer with 10, with 10 output neurons. And actually we use a softmax. Do you know what the softmax is doing? What is the softmax doing? So the output of the last layer is, is a vector of length 10. So you put a sample inside, and the output is a, is a vector of 10 numbers, 10 floating point numbers. What is the softmax doing? Ten numbers whose sum is between uh, is equal to one. Yeah, exactly. Computes ten numbers. Numbers are between zero and one, uh, and their sum uh, their sum adds up to to one dot zero. Yeah, exactly. Very very right. You can interpret those numbers as probabilities if you like to. If they are strictly seen, if they are a mathematical clearly defined probability, that's a different question. That depends. For, for, for example, what does this depend on? If they, those are real probabilities. S something that you would really say this is an equivalent to a probability. It depends on the choice of the loss function, right? So cross-entropy loss would be a loss where you could say that this is a, this is a maybe likelihood, I would call it, not, not a probability. Okay, okay. But let's, let's go going a bit into, in, into the mass of, of, of the whole thing. Okay, now we need to compile the model. And to comp compile the model means, it, it does a lot of things, but basically we add a few things. We add a loss. So to train any neural network model, you need at least one loss. <coughs> you can actually have many losses, uh, which makes the thing more complicated, but let's say one loss, okay? And the loss is usually that thing that you want to, 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 to the, the loss is the vehicle you use to tell the model what it should do, where it should go to, what is better. And usually the loss me measures something like a prediction error. Like this is very wrong, and later, you know, the wrong thing gets less wrong, so your loss goes down, okay? And here we propose sparse category, uh, categorical cross-entropy, which is a loss that measures on these 10 numbers, it measures how much we are mispredicting a set of 10 classes or 10 categories, okay? And later we, we want the model to compute the accuracy as a metric. So the metric is not a loss, the metric is more a, a how to say, an, another, another indicator that tells you how good is your model or how <coughs> satisfied you could be with your model, okay? With model fit, we train the model. And in deep learning you train a model on, on input data or training data called, and usually, there's a pair of training data. There's X and Y, or inputs and outputs. What is the difference? What, what, or, or features and labels. Uh, that all means the same thing. W what is a feature, what is a label? It's a Yeah, so the features is what you have. Let's say you, you want to predict, um, you want to predict the weather, no, 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 this is a bad example, um, <coughs> the income of a person, right? And the label, this is for example, the person earns more than, give me a number, $100,000 less than $100,000. Um, if you're in San Francisco, it's always true, always, okay? <laughs> Stupid joke, it's not true. Um, <laughs> 
that there are so many homeless that, that uh, uh, it's, it's actually not, not, not that good there, in my opinion. Um, so the label is you earn, for example, more than $100,000 or you earn less than $100,000. That's a binary label, like zero or one, okay? And the input features, what could be good input features if you want to predict how much a person earns? There are many possible. Give me some ideas. What could be a good input feature? Age studies. Age studies. Location. But if you look all over the world, what would it be? What else would it be? Location. 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 What did we get? If, if the person lives in Silicon Valley or in Tokyo or whatever, you know, the probability is much higher than if you live in, you know, some remote area. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, th th this is a difficult topic, right? <laughs> um, yeah, of course, demographics, um, the, the, uh, not only the education level, it's what you studied. You, com you studied TensorFlow, it's good, right? Um, no, you studied computer science, it's good. Um, you studied history, it's not that good. <laughs> Okay. I need to stop this. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, that is the thing. There are features. This is the data you have, and the labels is the the labels is usually what you want the model to predict later on. But you have a training data set where you collected labels for the features for some of the features, and you try to give those as examples, and you hope that the model learns from this and generalizes on 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 the data. Okay. Um, here we not only give a metric and a loss, we give also an optimizer. Uh, what is an optimizer? It's a central algorithm with Yeah, it's kind of, so, so like I said, mostly we train deep learning models with something it's called stochastic gradient descent. And let me, let me I, I'm, I'm talking too much without, without uh, um, can you see this? Okay. So, basically, if you look at the landscape uh, that your loss defines over your weights, and here are only two weights. Here are only two weights. A, a neural network with two weights is, of course, extremely simple. Most typical neural networks have millions of weights, right? Like, I mean, thousands to millions to 200 millions, okay? Like this language translation models, they have I think there are some models that have a billion of weights, which is kind of a lot. And what you want to do is you want to go down the loss, right? You want to go from <coughs> some value where the loss is high, so the red part here, to some, some uh, value where the loss is low, okay? And you do this in small steps. So that is called stochastic gradient descent, because you take only a few samples of your training data set, and you compute the gradient, and you make a step in the direction of the gradient, um, and then again, you 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 recompute. I mean, you use another batch of samples from your from your training data set, and you do this in a very in a very let's say step by step fashion, right? You don't try to go a long shot from 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 the yeah from the hills to the valley. You're trying to go really in, in very small steps, and actually you can end up in 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 something that's called local minima, right? You see this here that actually if you start here, you end up there. And if you start a bit more here to the left, uh, you end up in another minima. Okay. And again, another explanation here is the stochastic gradient descent. Because you, you compute this gradient only on a small amount of samples, your, your, your gradient is actually very stochastic. Stochastic means it's not always showing exactly in a good direction. It's more or less like, like sometimes, like a dr it, it, stochastic gradient descent is actually like a drunk in a box hole, right? <laughs> It, the drunken walks almost in the right direction, but it's always a few steps to the left and to the right. But still, you know, he or she gets to the place, right? Um, so, and the funny thing is, when you have millions of weights, this stochasticity seems to help you, and it doesn't, it doesn't like destroy your your optimization. In the opposite, it, in my opinion, it helps you to tunnel. To all the local minima that you have that you have in your in your lost landscape, right? Where you could usually get stuck in. Okay, um, going back, we were here for beginners. Keras, the, the sequential like model for for uh, um, 
um, for, for Keras, how to define a, a deep neural network. And here's what we train on. So we give the features here, X train, um, we give the labels, Y train, and we tell the number of epochs. What's an epoch? The so one epoch is one run through all the training data you have. And you, since you do it in small batches, so-called mini batches, a mini batch can be 16 samples, and your data set can be a million, a million samples. So you would need five, about 500, uh, 50,000 steps, uh, 50,000 of the small stochastic you know, gradient steps to do one epoch. And often you do like 10, 20, or 100 epochs. Okay. And now the next line, in this last line, what do I do? I, what does this do? And why do I do this? <laughs> yes, so we trained on some examples, right? Like it's basically like teaching a child, right? You, you show to the child, this is a cat, this is a dog, okay? And you have five cats and five dogs. But if you want to check if you're child understands this, and mostly the children understand this after two examples, right? They're ex actually extremely, uh, humans are extremely <coughs> well at that. Um, you show them five different pictures of cats and dogs, and you ask them, well, what do you think? This is a cat or this is a dog, right? And then you, 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 you hope that they make zero mistakes on that new data set. And that new data set, it's sometimes called the, the evaluation data set or the test data set, Validation data set. We can we can we can go in detail. You can do a test validation whatsoever. Um, you usually it, it it needs to be disjoint, right? It cannot have common samples. You cannot have the same samples in test and in training, right? This is no no. Um, if you do that, you are kind of yeah. You are you 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 will get a too mostly you will, you will get a too optimistic value. Okay, this is Keras, how it looks for TensorFlow 1.0. And do you know how it looks for 2.0? <laughs> the same. Okay, something good. We like this. Okay. Um, that was the easy way. There, there are two more ways, at least two more ways. One more way is to use the functional API. I don't want to go into this. The other one is if you really want full control of what you do, you can do the so-called subclassing, uh, which basically means you derive a model from a base class, which here is the TF Keras model. Um, I don't want to go into it. If someone wants to try that, you can do this all in Cola. Okay. Um, and, and just for the sake of time, uh, the same for training. The easy way to train is to use the model fit, model.fit. So the fit, fit function is defined uh, uh, on, the, on this base class, model base class. Um, or you can define your own way of fitting and then you need to really go through the gradient tape. The gradient tape is a list of all the gradients with respect to all the, all the gradients, to, to all the, 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 the mutable variables in your, all the trainable weights in your, in your model. And then basically you, you get these gradients and then you have your optimizer, which again is an atom that we had before. Um, and we apply those gradients. So yeah, okay, that's, that's actually, that's actually, okay. Um, I think I, I, I skipped this somehow. Um, come, we're coming to the next exercise. Okay, there's a data set that was used in, in deep learning for too many years and it's called MNIST. And it contained 10 digits. I mean 10 digits, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, you know, 2, 9, 0 to 9, 10, altogether. Okay. And of course, now we can get 99 point some percent, you know, accuracy. So it's, it's kind of pointless. So Zalando, I don't get money from Zalando, um, created a new data set that has exactly the same format, exactly the same size, number of training samples. Uh, it's 28 by 28 grayscale images. Uh, 10 different categories. Now, of course, it's not digits, it's not one, two, three. It's actually pullover, sneaker, boot, ankle boot. Eight, uh, you will see it in, in uh, I mean, boot, uh, uh, um, whatever, right? Like, like, like clothing, right? That's what, what nerds mostly not pay attention to. Um, at least that's what my wife says. Um, I think she's right. Uh, is she here? Okay, no, she's not here. Uh, 
Um, so yeah, please go to the next exercise. Please open this. And uh, the task is add a validation data set um, and plot how the training and validation history is developing over 10 epochs. And uh, you can definitely go through this and, I mean, it, even if you don't do the task, go through this and please try to train your, train your model. Train your first model on this fashion and this data set. Uh, it, it's a call up I, I created, but it was mostly. Thanks to the link, please. We need to get right to the Oh, yeah, okay. I'm getting the same amount of screens. Yes, 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 I get it, I get it, I get it. Um, that's what, um, you know, this, this happens. In my age, this happens. Two more valves, two more valves. Give me one second. <laughs> try now, try now. Does it work? Yes. Can you show the link again? Yeah. Oh, not the zero. Oh, oh, shh. Okay. Oh, shh. Oh, shoot. You know that this is me. Okay. Um, yeah. It's not written by the tensor program. I mean, I copied it from the official ones. Um, please connect to a runtime. Basically, open it in playground mode. Connect to a runtime. What would you use? A GPU, of course. Why would you use a GPU? Because it trains much faster. Okay. So let's connect. Let's connect to it. Yes. Okay, and the good thing is, so if you execute the cell, um, that data set is really, it's, it's loaded from the internet, but you don't have to do a lot. And can you see, this download takes super little time. Why? Why does it take so little time? It's kind of, it's true, the data set is rather small. But again, where is the, where is the code executed? It's executed in a, it's executed in a in a Google data center, and Google's data centers are connected to the to the web with an incredibly fast internet. So it's kind of funny. Sometimes when I have to download some large data set, ImageNet, I go into a call up and I download it in the call up. It's so much faster than you can get it to your and from from the call up I can store it in Drive or on GCP because it's so much faster than your internet, than your Wi-Fi to your laptop. It's, uh, uh, so so the, 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 the kernel, the Python kernel that runs, it's, it's I, I would say it's 100 times faster connected to the internet than you can get at home with your Wi-Fi. So, okay. So once again, we come here to, the, to this data set, we can show it, I, I try to execute it here step by step, and we see the 10 classes, T-shirt top, trouser, clothes, dress, coat, sandal, shirt, sneaker, bag, and in boot. I don't even know what this is, all. okay? But we can look at that. Um, okay? And the human can kind of make sense of this rather, rather nicely, okay? Yeah, and here, what do we do here? We define the model, like I showed you before, as the, um, with the sequential uh, uh, interface of Keras, we compile it, we can use model summary. What does model summary give us? The structure and the number of weights. How many weights do you think we have? Trainable weights. Good, I think it's a super good guess, yeah. 100, 100, 1,000. I mean, it's, I can't guess it also beforehand. It's kind of a lot, right? Like, we have only 60,000 uh, training samples, so we have more parameters than we have samples. Okay, let's try to fit it. And this is the, the kind of the, the, Keras is a very convenient, very high level uh, um, package for, for deep learning. And you, you see here each epoch, Again, the data set is 60, the training data set is 60,000 samples. 
you see here that this is done, and you see also like like that actually this is executed super fast. Is someone executing it on a on a CPU, not on a GPU? Do you know how long it takes? <laughs> also, if you do it on CPU only. Okay. Now your task is to add a to find out it's it shouldn't take a lot of code to how to first of all add the validation data set. We have the validation data set, it's here. It's called X test and it's called Y test. You have it, right? You don't need to you don't need to do any any stuff. It's it's basically in the in, in the colour. Ah the call up has an actually the, the call up has tons of very super cool things. Um, you can see the variables. You can actually there are so-called magics uh, um, that you can use to, to to influence like how how this whole thing works. Um, this is actually super convenient. So I mean, if you are doing data science, you want to investigate certain stuff. You want a powerful machine. Let's say you want to have a powerful processor that crunches your data. Um, it's it, it's there. You can share it with your colleagues, with your boss, with whatever, super fast. So it's, it's a cool way. And it's kind of secure, right? Like, I mean, if you trust your Gmail, uh, your corporate Gmail, then, you know, uh, then I would also trust that. Um, of course, I mean, keep your password. Uh, but, but, but usually that, that's, that's quite cool. Okay. How much time should I give you? You want a lot of time or two, two three, five? Four or five minutes. I have a question. Sure, sure. Can you give us the example of using software? What not for classification is Usually you use it for classification. I know, that's why I said. I mean, now I know. I don't have any good example. I mean, you could, you could use it. I mean, uh, I mean, I use it in. I use, it for example, now for some where I really want to estimate the probability, and I want to calibrate the probability. So then, then there it works actually uh, quite quite nice on that. Um, okay. So. Okay. Now let me see. Shall I give you more time, or shall I go to the solution? Spoil, spoil it, or what? What is the function to, to validate? To validate, evaluate. Yeah. It's evaluate, but yeah. <coughs> but can anyone, any, anyone that has it, tell me what's your evaluation error? Zero point three five. 0 0.35. Oh, okay. That's a little. That's like, hmm? 0 0.35. 0 0.35? <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think I have a, I think I have the, did I share this? Okay. Sorry. Sorry for that. I have this. <coughs> okay, let's try this again. <coughs> Train it 10 epochs if you can. Train it for 10 epochs if you can. Was it better? 035 is super little. I had thought something in the 80s. But, uh, I have two numbers, 035 and 087. 035 is the loss, and 087 is the accuracy. Yeah, yeah. okay. Lock for the loss, this is super fine. Okay. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. 
Okay, I'm totally right. Since 035 is the uh, validation loss, the training loss is lower. So we, then we got to 035 and 90%. You got 035 loss and 90% accused. Validation loss, 0 0.25? Okay, I'll manage validation loss. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. then, okay. 0.3G. And you see something here, and that is very typical. So, okay, whoever, uh, uh, okay. You see here the training accuracy and the validation accuracy. So the training accuracy is on the training data set that we use to optimize the model, to train the model. And you see that this is going up very nicely. Uh, note that, have a look, it's not starting at zero, we are starting here already at 80%. And you see the training, the training accuracy is going up and up and up. I mean, at least it doesn't look like this is saturated. But you see something that, that the validation is lower. And this is a very typical case, right? You can very easily overfit any data set that you have, very easily. Uh, the funny thing is, it's not a lot overfit here, right? The model is still good in the way it is here. That's my, my take here on, 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 on that. Okay. <coughs> this is kind of the uh, solution. <coughs> I, I'll try to share these slides later, later with you. Okay, we had this already. So, what does TensorFlow give you as except like some carousel interface? It gives you, it gives you a lot of features that help you to work either on very small hardware or, or on very large hardware. Large hardware could be, I mean, this is how we trained it before. Now you say, well, I don't want to use one GPU, I want to use eight or 16. So then I would tell, tell, tell you, use a TPU. But some people want to use a, uh, they want to use several GPUs. And for this, you, you, you need um, so-called strategies in order to utilize these GPUs. It's actually not that trivial, uh, because see that you have to compute the gradient on different machines. What do you do? do? You add up the gradient, or you do independent gradient steps. So this is usually handled automatically by this strategy, and it's, 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 very, it's, it's a safe bet, at least in the beginning, to rely on these uh, strategies. Okay, coming to documentation. Um, there's a lot of examples what you can do with TensorFlow to Zero, and they are on the website. And they, most of them have this button run in Google Cola. So the same, in the same way I showed you this here, you can do it with all those examples. You can run it in Cola. You just need a computer. You, you need a laptop. You need the internet connection. You need Chrome and a Gmail account and you, you run it in Colab, you don't need your own setup, you don't need to do pip installs. Um, you can do, I mean, if you want, you can do pip installs in Colab, but most of the stuff is pre-installed, and especially for those, um, for those tutorials, you, there, there's nothing needed, right? You cannot, you cannot like, like, like destroy your um, installation that you have on your notebook. You don't need Docker or anything super heavy for that. Okay, for example, here's something, you know how this is called? It's called image to image translation. So you give an input image, this is this one, and this is the, the uh, and basically you ask it to, to translate this image into this image. Does it make sense? Okay, maybe I didn't explain it super nice. But um, what you can do is, maybe you saw this, with, 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 um, <coughs> Generative adversarial networks, you can create new data based on certain statistical assumptions, and you can create, for example, faces of people that never existed, right? But it just, you just draw them. Uh, of course, the, the, the generator learned before how people look like, but still it can, it can actually create variations of, of ex existing people's faces, and, and they look super realistic. Okay. Um, now, this is a bit more around. Um, what you do, you, you're usually your life cycle when you work with deep learning. There are two main things, two main phases. There's training, 
when you develop your model can take a lot of time because you need first you need to gather data this is not easy for example a big problem is you need to label data <coughs> there's an ecosystem of companies that will help you to label images uh, they will they will um, you can send them a million images they will ask you for a certain amount of money not not very little like 20 cents per image which is two hundred thousand um, dollars but they will send you back the labels for these images for example i used that once for um, detecting cars in a scene you know car you are in a car you want to do autonomous driving you want to detect cars so you have tons of you have tons it's very easy to generate a lot lots of images especially when you have cars that drive around and automatically take take the images but the problem is you need to uh, you need to label those images right you need to tell this there's a car there's a pedestrian there's a stop sign uh, there's a traffic light um, so labeling can be super expensive okay uh, it, i mean what i wanted to say it takes you sometimes months to generate a training data set okay usually for deep learning you have training and then you deploy the model and you run it for inference and both are quite heavy tasks it's not only like writing a few lines of code so for training you you tensorflow offers you utilities for reading and pre-processing data it's called tf data I'm not going into it we don't have enough time you have pre-trained models so training a large image uh, classification model it takes time right like like it even takes compute time it takes <coughs> it takes about several hours on a tpu uh, but fortunately you can download those models they are pre-trained you can download them from tensorflow hub there are uh, there, there are of course also even models you can download from the web you know people publish their models on even like on github or stuff like that uh, you have tf keras or you have so-called estimators not i'm not going into this i showed you keras you have the distribution strategy to work with with uh, distributed hardware uh, you can train on CPU, don't recommend that, except for some very smallish um, examples. Most people use GPU or TPU. A again, you can get free TPU, which is amazingly good, and it, 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 it allows you, basically, let's say you are at university, you, you have a small Chromebook, you can still train in, you know, in, in a few hours, you can train a large model, which is amazingly cool. I mean, you couldn't do this even five years ago, you, you needed to buy a machine, like, and put three or four GPUs in it, which costed you at least, I don't know, several thousand dollars. Okay, now you have that model. What do you do? You store it in TensorFlow, you store it, store it in a format, it's called saved model. Again, I don't want to go into it because it's, 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 it, it, it's, a, it's a lot of stuff. <coughs> um, but once you have that model, you put it on TensorFlow Serving. TensorFlow Serving is first of all a, a server, an application that you can install. It's, it's on Docker. You can set it up on your own server or, or set of servers. But you can also do it simply in the cloud, on GCP or also on AWS. Right? You, you, you just push the model to a certain service and tell that service, serve me that model. Um, which costs you, of course, per every prediction, costs you whatever, a, a microcent or something like that. Like not a lot. It's actually rather this serving is mostly the cheaper part of this. But uh, if you have a different, if you say no, 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 this uh, eats our uh, cloud budget, um, then maybe you serve a lot. Right? Um, you have TensorFlow Lite that allows you to take a model. First of all, TensorFlow Lite allows you to shrink a model, uh, make it much smaller because some models they are many megabytes or hundreds of megabytes. And you don't want to install hundreds of megabytes on your phone or your, you know, whatever it, whatever is your edge device. Um, so you can you can shrink it down and uh, make it actually also execute super fast. Um, TensorFlow.js allows you to run models in your in your browser. Um, I'm not super invested in, into this. You have bindings to many other languages: C, Java, Go, C Sharp, uh, even R, uh, R for data science. I like R, but I got out of it, for example, uh, very much, because there's so much more now in Python, especially that is closer to production. I mean, that allows you to work much closer to production than in R. Otherwise, R was great. Uh, OK, you deploy it on, on hardware, I mean, on servers, on edge devices. Edge devices is anything. 
anything with a you know embedded chipset, whatever, um, or in your browser. Okay. And the usual way for the training, um, this is basically repeating a bit what is there. It's data ingestion and transformation. For this, you have key of data feature columns. It's model building. You have teras, estimators, all writing custom code. You have training <coughs> with the whole thing. You have tens of board actually to, to monitor your training. And then you save the model. That is basically what you do during training. There's one more point to the left here. It's gathering your data, which can be, it can be hard. Right? It's easy to, to work on data that's, that you download from the web, but mostly that is not what you will do when you work in a company. Right? When, when you work in a company, you, you will work on your own data, or I mean, your own, like, let's say, data that no one else worked on before. Hopefully, I mean, you know. If not, I think then there, there's a problem. Um, TensorBoard, this is something I spoke to you about before. Who used TensorBoard before? So t TensorBoard is a tool to, to look over your training. It shows you here the, the, the scalars. It shows you like how your training is progressing, how your error is going down, uh, how your accuracy is going up. It can show you, here you see that, like the, the, the Apple Gloss. You can also inspect the images if you do like uh, any kind of vision-based model. Uh, you can look at uh, distribution histograms of your weights, of your gradients. Uh, you can look at the computation graph, so at the, at the structure of the model, which for me is still very, I don't know, it's very difficult to look at that. I mean, it's very difficult to, to understand the, the, the graph because they become super heavy. Um, okay, you can do profiling. So for example, when you work with a lot of accelerators, accelerators like, like a GPU or a TPU, uh, there's a problem. Sometimes you, you, you have eight GPUs and the training should run super fast, but, it, it's, but actually it's not running super fast. Why? What's the, what's the most common reason? Most, most common reason is that the data cannot be delivered fast enough to the GPUs or to whatever is the, the accelerating hardware, right? You have, let's say, um, half a terabyte of data you want to train on, Right, and you need to, every epoch means once, to go once through all of that data. And you need to push it somehow to all these GPUs, and the GPUs are fast. So you need to fill their, you need to fill them constantly with data. And when you don't prepare your data ingestion in a proper way, it's like this, the GPU is running, and then it's out of data. And it needs to wait, 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 until it gets new data, and then again it's running. So basically, instead of using your eight GPUs, you are slower than with one GPU. Uh, just because you cannot feed data fast enough. Um, and therefore you have such, such tools that to tell you exactly what's going on, how much time it's spent, for example, just on reading data. What, of course, is one of the fastest ways of, of, of putting data into a model? What's the fastest way? Yeah, but basically have the data in memory. In memory, this is fast, right? I mean, um, what is the problem with data and memory? You need a lot of memory. You need a lot of memory, right? Like, if you have, if you have 200 gigs of data, uh, but basically in the cloud you can find machines with 300 gigs of, of RAM. They cost a bit of money per hour, so on the other hand it might be fast. What is the second best way of feeding data to a model? Yeah, I mean, you feed them in batches, but how, how, how would you do it? SSD on VCA Express. SSD is good, but one SSD, how many? Okay, write zero you know, with yeah. how the, many ways you have. Yeah, the best, so, so actually a very good way is to, to store the data, and, and in, you're, you're right, but in, the, in my opinion, the easiest way is to store the data on cloud storage, cloud storage on GCP, for example. And cloud storage is distributed storage. It's stored on SSDs. I don't know on how many SSDs, I mean, physically, I don't know on how many SSDs it's stored. But first of all, you do something, you shard your data. What's sharding? You uh, cut it into pieces and... You hack it into, yeah, exactly. You hack it into a thousand pieces, a thousand files. Each file is between 10 megs, 100 megs, okay? So it's just a good, a good chunk, right, a good byte. Um, and most probably they will all live on, they will be kind of distributed over many SSDs, 
and then when you run this, for example, the training in the cloud, um, you, you get the read power from some number of SSDs. So, in my how opinion, this is... How many, how many network interfaces are the space? Once again, once again. Across how many network interfaces are splitting this load? Even uh, if the cloud has a thousand of SSDs, you're still running a logical. Yeah, but, but but I don't tra I, I I have the, the I train on TPU which is basically in the cloud. Yeah. I don't know how the TPU is connected to, to GCP. I mean I don't sorry. I don't know how the, the TPU server is connected to the uh, to the storage server. You m need to make sure you are in the same region. Basically, the same data center, you know, uh, th th that's the thing. Mostly, this is very fast. Th that's really fast. In my opinion, training in the cloud is faster than you can do on premise, except you have extremely good hardware. Extremely good and extremely expensive hardware. So, I mean, if you, if you put up uh, eight GPUs in a rack, right, and, and I still doubt that you are much faster. I mean, it depends. If you spend a lot of time and money and, 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 and uh, optimization, you might make it faster. I, I, I don't bother. I, I mean, not I don't bother. Um, I don't want to spend my time building hardware. You know, because it's... Uh, there are people that can do it better. So I like to put it in the cloud. This is my opinion. This is not, you know, it's not exactly what... what uh, uh, that might not be relevant for every case. Where are the cases where you need your own hardware? When you have very confidential data, when you have data that you don't want to share with anyone, not even with Google or AWS, or if you are legally bound to have the data in, in a certain way, of course, then you need to build up the hardware. But building up the hardware and maintaining is cost. It takes people to build this up. It takes people to administrate that. Is it faster in storage or from BigQuery? I don't know. This is a good, super good question. Um, so if, if you serve faster from cloud storage or BigQuery, I didn't try. I didn't try. I, I didn't try BigQuery. So I work with BigQuery. Usually I go BigQuery to TF Records. This is TensorFlow Records and from TF records into into the, the training. So into the into the, 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 the yeah, training hardware. So the, this is the usual way. It also because I need to do certain transformations on the way. So so you could do it in BigQuery. See that there's a problem with BigQuery. For BigQuery you pay every time you go through the data. So I'm I do not I d I don't I don't know so, so BigQuery you pay five dollars per terabyte. Uh, of data that you query, and if you let's say you, you have a certain query that gives you that brings out 200 gigs of training data at the end, so you would pay for every epoch five dollar, which I kind of think is a lot. So I would, would first I would once go to BigQuery, store it as TF records, store it cheaply in, in a bucket, um, and and from there go go there. Who worked with a bucket and on AWS as GCP or something? Like that? Yes. Who has from you has a cloud account, uh, a GCP account? Okay. <coughs> possibly, possibly. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not compared to BigQuery. That's not my yeah. I, I don't know the answer. I, 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 yeah, yeah, definitely, I don't know the answer to, to this BigQuery thing. So, so BigQuery can be reasonably fast. Um, Apo is, is, is actually a very nice format. I like it. So, so I think there there is something. The point is, it's something. It's very difficult to to tell all this beforehand. It really depends on your case. Be fast, iterate, try stuff. Then you know how to do it the fastest. Uh, uh, and that meaning again, do it in software. Don't do it in hardware. I mean, in my opinion, it's always waste your time best on software, not on hardware. Right, like try two or three different approaches in cloud instead of building up your hardware, which leaves you stranded, you know, with a lost investment. Uh, if 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 you if it doesn't work as you like, okay. There's tons of um, there's tons of uh, uh, um, there's tons of documentation for TensorFlow, so please try to check it out. The type in TensorFlow into Google, and you should get there. Um, there was a lot of speed up gained over TensorFlow in the last in the last year of development because TensorFlow actually 
wasn't so fast as it as people thought it to be. So actually PyTorch was somewhat faster. I don't know what's faster now, I didn't compare it against, but I just know that, that TensorFlow got a bit faster. Inference time is also very much faster. Um, here you see the difference if you run inference, so you run prediction, this is inference. Uh, on a CPU, a mobile net model, it takes you 124 milliseconds for one sample, which is actually a lot. You can quantize the model, that's what I talked about. You can shrink down the model, and then actually you get almost twice as fast. Um, you can, you can uh, do the inference on GPU, so I'm, this is another topic we could talk for quite a lot of, uh, quite a lot of time if it's better, better to run uh, inference on CPU or on GPU because GPU is expensive and stuff like that. Or you can run it on an HTPU. An HTPU is actually not this thing that I showed you before that has this super many te teraflops. It's a tiny, mini chip that you can install on something like a ros Raspberry, and it's, it's still extremely fast. Okay, beyond just TensorFlow, there's, for example, TF pro probability. Do you know what this is? <coughs> this TF probability is a package that basically integrates with TensorFlow and allows you to do all this stuff with random numbers, especially it allows you to, to do probabilistic programming, that meaning a lot of Bayesian stuff, Bayesian models, and that's ex actually extremely interesting if it comes to real life data. And my take here is that there's something similar from PyTorch called Pyra, or I'm not sure if it's from PyTorch, but it's, it's, it's more the direction of PyTorch, it's called Pyra. And I think this will be a super interesting thing for businesses, for, for business data in the next years. My take is that not a lot of people know that, know how to use that yet. But this is actually super interesting. TF agents, it's about reinforcement learning. Tensor to Tensor is a set of, it's kind of a framework for running models under a very, um, very uh, controlled uh, environment. TF ranking is if you have ranking problems. Where, where would you use ranking? It's hmm? oh, Yeah, recommendations. Everything you search and you want to like kind of present results to a user, and you want to make sure that the first n results are the most relevant results. Uh, TF text is a toolbox that helps you to work with text files, federated, I don't know myself. Okay, Could, whom of you heard the, um, the term convol convolution neural networks? Okay, so uh, the idea is have a look, you have an image, you have an image, you have an image of cats, because we, everyone likes cats, right? Mm. Or dogs, whatever, okay? Um, okay, um, no, <laughs> in San Francisco you see more dogs than, I, I don't know, dogs are treated better than everyone else, uh, <laughs> honestly. Um, you see, people don't have kids anymore, they just have dogs. Um, um, yeah. Okay, then you have an image and you have a cat or a dog on that image. What happens if you move the, this image a bit in the, you know, if you, if, you, if you move the head of the dog a bit in the, or the cat down the, it shouldn't change anything, right? So what it means to be, what that means is if you do this if you if you do the if you work on that image, you should look for local features, right? Like features that pick, you should look on pixels that are close to each other, right? This makes much more sense than 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 trying to find an eye here and a nose here, right? Usually, this is something that that's basically a bias from the real physical world. Is objects are compact, right? They move in a coherent way. Okay, so so does the image. Okay, so you have convolutional neural networks, and uh, this is a three by three kernel. So you have you have nine rays. They are arranged in a square, and you move them over your image. Your image is here, and basically what you do is uh, you multiply the pixel values. The pixel values here is one one zero 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 one 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 zero. Okay, you you move your your convolutional kernel that is here in yellow, right? You move it over the image you multiply the kernel rates with the, the pixel values, and then you get the output. So l look again, we start up here in the left, left upper corner, 
we do this and we sum, sum up the we sum up this product and then we get this this output and this is so called the output of the convolution <coughs> and the nice thing with such a way of operating is that you really do the same transformation uh, over the whole size of an image right so in this way th this is a way of of doing kind of a neural network that is location independent some you can argue yeah in, in detail it's not totally true there's the, the border which makes a difference but mostly it's it's independent okay and convolution help you if, if you do the image recognition image recognition on an object recognition on a large image thousand by thousand which is i mean it's kind of large like I, what is the size of a modern photo uh, if you take it with your smartphone what's a typical size it's, it's like 8,000 by 4,000 or 6,000 by 5,000. I mean, they are extremely large nowadays. You have 20 megapixel, you have 40 megapixel. Uh, it's crazily huge. If you wanted a fully connected neural network, you would end up with 10 to the power of 12. This is uh, parameters, weights. Parameters, that means weights. This is a million millions. Uh, parameter so this is super much it's actually super wasted so when you do this the same thing with a convolution neural network you end up with, with, with much much less parameters actually this is even still a lot you would, you would most probably never use 10 by 10 okay there's another way of reduce the resolution of an image when you do it uh, when you do this this kind of deep neural network it's called max pooling Max pooling is an operation that's kind of easy to understand. The colors, are, okay, colors are not super, super. Uh, you see this whatever pink, reddish color. So the max pool operation does the following: it takes those four pixels, it takes the pixel value, it takes the max of them. So what is the max of this? Six. Six. Okay, we put this here. What's the max here? You get it. You get a job as GPU. Okay. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Um, three, if if you want, right? Like, um, no, I mean, guys, it's it's, it's not about of, uh, machine learning is cool because you can teach machines to do the work that before humans had to do, like looking at images and finding objects was super difficult before. Like even eight years ago. It was almost impossible to get any algorithm to reliably label a million images. Now you can do that. It's good, it's also frightening. You can now do face recognition extremely well, and you can do it on everyone. I mean, basically you can do it on, on everyone, meaning you could, you could do it on all the cameras in the world. I mean, all the street, you know, all the monitoring in the world. You can do it because now you can do it in, with, with hardware, with chips, for free, 24, uh, not for free, but cheap for 24 hours. It's frightening, but it's definitely doable. This is the, it's, it's, it's a positive, but also a very frightening thingy because you, you know, uh, if you get into a, get into a totalitarian, where, you know, type of government, you could track ev where everyone is going in the city. It's easy, right? Um, so yeah, beware, beware the you know, the, whatever you know, beware the revolution. Um, okay, coming. It's I think I'm talking already super much. Um, training and confidence. Last exercise. Please open this. Let's see if this works. Yes. Okay. Um, so this here is we had. It's again a collab. Before I trained a feed-forward neural network with where everything is connected with everything. Please put in the green lines at the right at the right place because this would give you a convolutional neural network. And I want you to go home and say, "Mama, I trained my first convolutional today." <laughs> or Papa, or to your husband, or to your wife, or whatever. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, try to see where this fit in. Look at this greenish. Oh, the colors are super different. Uh, look at this greenish lines. You can you can read that, right? Yeah. 
It's really good. Um, you know why this is a problem? Everyone thinks you see the same colors, but you know that most, uh, many men cannot discriminate red and green. It's actually super, super heavy. So, so actually, when you do presentations, there are there are mm, color checkers to, to check that everyone can can see the colors. So, if any, anyone can't see it, please tell me. Then I try we see all the gray here. <laughs> yes, you all the gray text, yes. It's gray for you? Yeah. <laughs> okay, then. go on. Okay, please try to put it into this call up and try to run it and tell me, tell me the validation error. I can do this in... And this will be the, the last exercise for today. Whoever has the validation error, tell me. And you see it's actually quite slow because I'm running this out of GPU. <coughs> okay, let's for a moment look at it. So I'm training here, I'm training, you see this. <coughs> Okay, when you choose a GPU, your kernel restarts because basically you're, you're transferred to a different machine. It will not be on the same VM, on the same virtual machine. It will go to a, a it will definitely go to a different machine. Because you know, this, the, the CPU one doesn't have a, a, a GPU clause. I would also point 23. Point? 23, 23. Wow. A loss. What's your uh, validation? Uh, 88. Okay, how much have you have before? In the feed or in the fully connected place? Uh, I don't know. 87. 87? Oh. Not much better. <laughs> okay, let's see. I think this should be faster. Is it faster? Oh, that's kind of a difference, right? Like, like as a GPU is already quite, quite faster. And you see also something like the first epoch takes most the longest. It often it takes the longest because the the GPU has to kind of warm up. Warm up is not not literally thermically warming up, but all the data has to be pushed to the GPU. So uh, uh, um, there, there's a certain you know when you run stuff the first time. It takes usually longer than when you want to do it. You see, it go, went down from 10 to, to 5 seconds per gram. And you see, this is definitely much faster than with the CPU. I doubt the CPU would be a minute for one epoch, right? Okay, anyone is still running it? Can I, can I show it? Okay, I have 0 and 19. Yeah, 90.7, something, something like that. That's actually quite good. For the fashion analyst data set, the best I could do was 91.8 or something like that. Um, okay, everyone. First of all, thanks for your attention. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Now, you know what happened. Data science was the longest to take to, to, to adapt Cola as a tool, but the data engineers, so more the classical software engineers, they said, hey, this is super cool. We, they put it in every bug in Jira, they put the cola with the with the few lines of code, how to reproduce the bug. How to, you know, how to, the, the few lines of code, how to interact with the system, and, and then we can, when you fix the bug, you can use the cola to actually check if the bug is, if the bug is still, um, is still alive. Because, you know, with your backend, you can you can easily ah with the call up actually when you, you can you can authenticate and you can connect to a GCP backend 
like to, to, to a project on GCP. You can run BigQuery from from up and, and stuff like that. So actually, the the classical software engineers, not the not the data science, they use it as a, as a tool just to send around and show you, hey, this is the bug. Um, um, you know, like here you can check it. Here you can check it, reproduce it, and then you know uh, when you fix it, we will check it in the call up. You know, if, if the thing is fixed. And mostly the call ups are just a few sets, like three four sets. Sometimes often a query, and then just showing a, a big query, query, and, and then showing the stuff. Okay, do you have questions? The slide you're talking about, how do you buy cheap airplanes tickets? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I mean, could we have uh, Google Flights, Google Flights, <laughs> Skyscanner? Um, okay. Help you? No, uh, buy it about 80 days before the flight, if you can. It's, it's a rule of thumb, right? Avoid peak, peak times. I mean, peak times in US, if you fly before Thanksgiving, like the day before Thanksgiving and the end of the weekend after Thanksgiving, this, you pay a lot, right? If you can, try to shift it by, you know, Fly in February to US, it's the cheapest. It's typically February is the, the, the low season on the northern northern hemisphere. Southern hemisphere it's not because it's summer, right? In the southern hemisphere. Um, so um, February is low because you know most uh, most places are not really attractive because the weather is not good, right? Um, use budget airlines. I I don't want to give names. Uh, <laughs> we know them. There, there are a lot. I mean, actually, the, the number of airlines is growing, and you know that you can fly. I won't tell the name of the airline, but you can fly from, for example, from Krakow to New York for three hundred dollars, which is, yeah, amazingly cheap. It's, you know, it's in my my case, it's not one of the large carriers. You know, it's a small one. Um, of course, no lunch, no nothing included. Um, <laughs> no bathroom, just empty places, right? No, you see, it, you see, it. it's it's a bit like like uh, the you know, it's a bit like Ryanair, but like uh, transatlantic, right? Um, I I spoke to a guy. I think he bought the, the ticket New York Oslo for hundred twenty dollars. One way, one way, which is still I think very cheap. Um, in general, look around. Look around, you you will find it. Uh, I think it's there. There's no real magic to, to do that. There are something like error fares or stuff like that, but but I wouldn't. They mostly don't help you because they are not at this time when you have to go. Error fares when when the the revenue management did an error, but it's it's getting more and more and more infrequent. Now, what do you do for registration pipeline? I'm okay. For training pipeline, I often even run it simply in Cola. Uh, TFX, TensorFlow Extended, helps you to, to, if you wanted to do the full integration, use Cloud Dataflow to generate data, uh, and then do this. Kubernetes, of course, is, is, is a good way. Now, how you do it, Airflow, Argo, not, this is not my topic. I mean, this is not my, my specialty. Like, um, I, I mean, it, it depends now to, to what level you want to go. Like in, with everything, or I mean, you want to, to retrain and some stuff every, every day, and every week, every week, yeah. Kubernetes, Kubernetes. And, and, and. I mean, you you have you have cloud ML training jobs that you can start with, yeah. So so it, it it depends on how much work you have to do to, to get your training data generated. If there's any manual step in between that you still have to do. So yeah. It's it's not I I, I mean I cannot answer it super uh, generally. It depends on, on, on the task. Uh, can you share the slide and maybe you comment where to pick up? Ah sorry, yeah more information. Sorry. So definitely start on the um, official website. There's kind of a lot of information, and there are different. I mean, these are just two books, and I don't get any money from that, right? Um, there are there are 
dozens of books around. Uh, check it out, and, and, and actually there's a lot of information, but use cool up to try stuff. It, it really helps. Reading three books doesn't help you as much as trying 10 examples yourself. And 10 examples you can try in, in two or three days. I mean, you know, like, 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 depends on how, how, how deep you, you want to dive into. And also, yeah, d d definitely hands-on, hands-on is more than this. Well, and one more thing, there's no way of, of knowing beforehand what is the right architecture for a project. You need to iterate, you need to build something, let it run, check it out, really try to get an idea of the quality and then iterate on it. And the faster you can iterate, the, the, the faster you will get to something. That, that's my experience. Yeah. One question, uh, what do you think about Alcatraz? Did I go it? I tried it once in Pro. Uh, th that was a long time ago, so maybe now it's better. Mm, if I remember right, it's mostly for image, for vision, for vision uh, tasks. Text and image. Okay, I didn't try it for text, I just tried it for images. Um, I mean, the idea is interesting. I think this is quite cool. Um, for example, what we do in, 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 in the, the company I'm in, it's, it's not that simple. Our problems are not that simple as they, they wouldn't fit into this you know, framework. So, uh, unfortunately, I, we can't use that. Like, like, I think with all the outer things in some, with auto, auto ML, auto Keras, um, they, they are cool, but they won't help you mostly with all the business side of your problems. In, in the end, 60% of your time is gathering data and filtering and cleaning data. And 10% is, 10 is uh, modeling and training and, and finding architecture. And 20% is deployment and, and 50%, another 50% is selling it to your boss um, and stakeholders. So, yeah, this is together 150%. Okay. So, something like that. Okay. No, more. no uh, one, one question. So considering the, the nature of the algorithms, there, most of them are really old, maybe from the 60s or 70s. Okay. Ah, not 60s. 80s. 80s, 80s 90s. But okay. they got more popular and widespread recently. What do you think about the future applications of machine learning and AI in general? Will it get a little bit more ground breaking or will it be limited to only this set of uh, operations and, and use cases, but faster and a little bit more accurate? Or can we think about more futuristic scenarios as well? Um, <clears throat> okay. First of all, AGI, like, general, like, like if you say really futuristic, artificial general intelligence, I, it might come, it might not. I, it's, it's incredibly difficult to really predict this beforehand. It's of course extremely cool to think about it, but I didn't see anything that convinced me. But I don't know what's in the laboratories around the world, what's, you know, what, what people do. Um, one thing is, we need to get down from a million samples to five. Training, I mean, you know, like, um, it, it cannot be that I have to show the algorithm like millions of images and it starts to learn. You know, it starts to be able to, to, to discriminate. Humans can do it with incredibly much samples. And this is especially true when you go to reinforcement learning. You know, you, you, reinforcement learning, AlphaGo, super cool. Um, Dota 5, you know, super cool. Just learn on 5,000 years of simulated gameplay. You know, like, it's no human. I mean, humans can do this usually after a few, I mean, maybe they are not, they are not the master, but after a few days of gameplay, they already get, get the stuff. Um, we, we, I think reinforcement learning, when we can get it down to very much, 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 much less samples than now, so much, much more sample efficient, that could be a big thing. That could help to run power plants, to, to optimize uh, schedules for the doctor, you know, for a doctor, for the bus, for, you know, like the, 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 the timetable for a bus. Um, I, I think this could be a really big thing. My, my person, very personal opinion is that 
human brain is already by evolution very much structured. It's very much adapted to the world, to the real physical world. So the, when, when a child learns to, about the world, it's not starting so much from scratch as we do with the neural networks. Um, and I think we need to find this, this kind of prior, this kind of, you know, uh, 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 yeah, prior that we need to put into this. this. That's my take. I'm not sure how to get there and, and, and what would be the steps even to start to, to get there. But um, I, I, I think this could work, right? Like, for example, the, how do you say, like doing a lot of business stuff, you show it to you show some examples. You show mostly your apprentices. You show them maybe five or ten or maybe twenty examples, and then still they need to experiment. But they experiment with another twenty examples, and then they can do something. And now reinforcement learning is take these numbers by a million, and then you get there. Right? So this is of course crazy. This is a crazily big difference. And even if you can get this down to to, you know, to, I don't know, a few thousand samples, that would be already a big, big step ahead. That's, that's my, my current take. If there will be real, and then now coming back, real artificial general intelligence, I don't know. So we could have like a computerized model, like a big database brain, and yeah. just like learn, teach everything, and just like, but you have one that you... It, it, it could be that you need to, 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 to prep a gigantic model with, yeah, with, with all the, the, the data in the world, and then you get something like an equivalent of a human brain. I don't say a consciousness, I don't say a person, it will maybe not have emotions, but it would be able to really understand a lot of it. Understand and classify a lot of stuff, maybe. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that. I have no, I have no idea of this, really. It's super interesting, but, but, but I, I think the, the more I think about it, the less I understand at all what this is, what consciousness is, right? how you define it, or how you prove it, or I don't know. Um, we have some recommendations for predicting nonlinear data, things like health, the parameters. Once again, so ahead. Do you have, do you have some recommendations for models uh, for predicting nonlinear data? I mean, all the data is extremely non-linear. Like images are non-linear non in some sense, right? Um, LSTMs are cool. Like, like LSTMs still work uh, actually super nicely. Like, so if you if you want medical, if you would work on medical data, especially like taking the whole history of you know the, yeah. it, it, a health or a treatment history, I think LSTMs are still a good choice to start with. Uh, but again, you cannot define the uh, the architecture. You don't define it beforehand. You start with something, you iterate, and you might end up with something very, very different than that you started with. So, so yeah, that, that's my that's my take. There's no person in the world that that you know sits down and cranks out ResNet without trying. You know, uh, the new ResNet without trying trying some you know, many, many iterations before. The biggest problem is, and that's my opinion, is there are still not enough people who can use this, uh, let's say, TensorFlow to the, uh, TensorFlow PyTorch, whatever, and come up with new ideas. I think this is still a question of time until the next generation of, you know, people is coming from university and learn, for example, yeah, tens of low probabilistic modeling and stuff like already in courses. Then we will see like I think the, uh, uh, another acceleration of, of new um, applications and stuff like this. That, that's my idea. I've revised one of the GPT standards on some instances. Once again, what have you applied this model? Yeah, yeah. Uh, which, which uh, so so definitely I. I GPT. Uh, I mean language, language, yeah, NLP. Yeah, no, 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 no. Actually, I worked very, very, very little with with, with NLP. Like, like a lot of my colleagues did a lot, but no, most division and type series is, is, is my my thing. Okay, everything else we take offline. We are already over time. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.